Hey, in this video we're going to look at different ways to represent reactions. You've probably already done balanced molecular equations. Here we're going to add on to that net ionic equations, which is a way to show what's actually reacting in the solution, as well as particulate diagrams, which is a way to draw a picture to, sh to represent a reaction. This goes with these AP standards up here if you're interested in that. Let's look at an example. When aqueous solutions of sodium hydroxide and magnesium chloride are combined in a beaker, a solid precipitate forms at the bottom of the beaker. In other words, we've got two solutions, we're in the lab, we mix them together, and then a solid forms at the bottom of the beaker there. Let's start with drawing our molecular equation. Now, if I do anything in this first part that you don't completely understand, it might be good to go back and review some things from your introductory chemistry. Um, so let's start with this. A solution of sodium hydroxide, um, NaOH, and we're going to put the states of matter subscripts for these. That's going to be important for us. That's aqueous sodium hydroxide as opposed to solid sodium hydroxide. Plus magnesium chloride. Now for magnesium chloride, um, magnesium is in that second um, group or column on the periodic table. So it's got a plus two charge. Chlorine is a halogen. It's going to be in the group, group 7A. And so it's just going to have a minus one charge. So it would take two chlorines to balance out the charge of magnesium. So that would be MgCl2 aqueous. And then our products are going to be sodium chloride. Now later on in AP Chem you'll learn the solubility rules. Um, sodium is always going to form soluble salts. So this will be aqueous. Anything with sodium in it will be aqueous. And magnesium hydroxide. And again hydroxide has got a negative one charge so we're going to need two of them. Um, and magnesium hydroxide. And that must be our solid because it's not sodium chloride. So there's our solid precipitate. All right, that's our molecular equation. Let's move on to our particulate diagram to show what's really going on in the solution. Oh, and I need to balance it as well, um, which you should know how to do at this point. A two there and a two there is going to balance out all of our ions. If you hear in the background, my daughter back there, she's playing with her toys, so she may chime in from time to time as well. Um, all right, so let's start with our particulate diagram now. In our particulate diagram, we've got I'm going to do this with three beakers. I'm going to draw our two solutions in here that we'll mix, and then finally our product in a third beaker here. In our first beaker, we've got sodiums and hydroxides. And I'm going to draw two sodiums. I'm going to draw two hydroxides. And I'll just do that with a little oval and put the ion name in there. If you've got different colors, that's a good way to do it as well. On the AP exam, you won't be able to write in different colors. So we've got our ions here. Now, I didn't have to include two of each. The main thing is important is there is the ratio that there's the same number of sodiums and hydroxides. Um, so I could have done three and three, one and one. I could have done a million and a million. In reality, we've got you know maybe a mole of these reactants in this solution, and so um, we really got a lot more than that. We're just representing it in a in a more simple way. Um, over here, we've got MgCl2. So I'm going to include one magnesium for every two chlorides, and so I did that here with two Cl's. Um, and one magnesium ion. But remember, I could have done two and four or any as long as I'm keeping those ratios equivalent. Now over here, I'm gonna produce these products. For my solid product, I'm just gonna do that by sort of drawing a, a lump at the bottom to represent my solid. I'm just gonna write out um, that. And I'm not gonna separate it into magnesium and hydroxides because they do exist together. They're a solid, they're not aqueous and floating around separately. They're together as solid. Um, sometimes you may see something like this, or you may need to draw something like this. It just depends on how you're trying to represent it. We're going to stick with this for now. But if you wanted to show, you know, that, that these are actually, you know, this is an ionic compound that forms this crystal lattice, maybe we could draw something like this. But this is pretty good for us right now, so we'll stick with that. Also in solution, then what do we have left? Well, we've got sodiums and chlorides now. I'm going to include um, the amount that matches here. i got two sodiums, so I'll include two sodiums over here and two chlorides, so I'll include two chlorides over there. This is what's actually happening in solution. I want to point out something that will help us with our now ionic equation. Notice I've got chlorides and sodiums here. I had two chlorides in solution. Here I had two chlorides in solution. So a question we might ask is, did those actually do anything in the reaction? And the answer is they didn't really. We call those spectator ions. They're there to balance off the charge of the magnesium here or the hydroxide here, but they weren't involved in the reaction. Same thing with the sodiums here. We started with some sodiums in solution. We ended with sodiums in solution. Did anything change? No. Magnesium is different though. Magnesium, we start with magnesium ions, 
And we ended with magnesium hydroxide solid. So that was a chemical change. And so those are actually taking part as well as hydroxides in the reaction. So let's do next what we call a complete ionic equation. For that, we're gonna write out all of the individual ions that are in our solutions here. So two sodiums, two sodium ions, plus two hydroxide ions, two hydroxide ions. And the reason we write this out is because in solution, sodiums and hydroxides aren't together. It's actually sort of misleading to write sodium hydroxide because we lump them together like this, but they're not. They're completely separate in solution. If anything, they're more, they have a stronger attraction to the water molecules than they do with each other. So this is a little bit more accurate way to represent it. Why don't we write this out all the time like this? Well, because it takes longer. Look how much I had to write here versus how much I had to write here. So it's, it's quicker for us to write a molecular equation, but the complete ionic equation will help us get to our net ionic equation. We'll do the same thing over here. We're gonna have a magnesium ion for every two chlorine ions, chloride ions. And over here we have sodium, we have chloride. Now notice I didn't separate the magnesium and the hydroxide out because here they're not separated. When they exist as a solid, we gotta draw them together. They're not separate ions anymore. They're, they're a solid that's actually together. And so we include that there. Now we're gonna treat this kind of like a math equation. We're gonna cancel out anything that's added to the left side and added to the right side. So for example, I've got sodiums on the right, two of them, and two aqueous sodium ions on the left. So I can cancel those out. I also have um, two chloride ions on the left, two chloride ions on the right. So I'm gonna cancel those out. Those were the spectators. We don't need to represent those in our net ionic equation. We're just gonna rewrite out everything we're left with and that will be our net ionic equation. So we're gonna have two hydroxides and a magnesium on the left and magnesium hydroxide solid on the right. And this is what we call our net ionic equation. How did we get that? We started with our molecular equation. We broke that up into the ions. So we drew our complete ionic equation. And then we canceled out things that exist on the left and the right side to get our net ionic equation. And again, back up here, what, what really happened in this reaction? The sodiums and the chlorides didn't do anything. Well, what happened was the hydroxides bonded with the magnesium and formed magnesium hydroxide solid at the bottom of the beaker. That's what really took place in the reaction. We call that our net ionic equation. And this is how we represent it with our particulate diagram. Let's look at a couple more examples and I'll move a little bit quicker through these other examples. In this next one, we have hydrochloric acid added to potassium hydroxide. No visible change occurs, but the beaker feels warm. And that's how we know that a reaction took place is because we have that temperature change. We didn't see anything take place, but we can feel it. And this is gonna be um, an acid added to a base. We call this a neutralization reaction. So let's start with our molecular equation. We have hydrochloric acid, HCl, plus sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, sorry. And that's gonna be a double displacement reaction um, where the hydrogen is gonna bond with the hydroxide to form water and the potassium will, will this is wrong. I, I'm about to say something wrong. I was gonna say that potassium bonds with the chloride. We'll see that that actually doesn't take place like you might think it would in a double, disp double displacement reaction. So we form H2O liquid and potassium chloride aqueous. Notice I put an L for liquid there and not aqueous. The liquid means that that's the solvent. We just produce more of the solvent. Aqueous means we have, for example, potassium and chloride ions dissolved in our solvent of water. That's what aqueous means. Liquid just means that is our solvent. All right, there's our reaction. So let's do our particulate diagram for this. Oh, also it's exothermic, meaning that it feels warm. Um, okay, for our particulate diagram, let's kind of do that same setup there. Um, here in this beaker on the left, we've got hydrogen and chloride. So hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Um, this is a strong acid, so we draw them separately. Later on, I'll cover strong versus weak acids and, and how we treat those separately in this. Um, we've got potassium hydroxide, which is a strong base. So we've got potassiums, we've got hydroxides. Notice I did two potassiums, two hydroxides. The main thing is I'm keeping those ratios the same. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, one potassium, one hydroxide, one potassium, one hydroxide. Even though I drew two of them, 
that doesn't have to match the subscript here, it just has to match the ratio. Over on the right side, we're going to have potassiums and chlorides. Notice I didn't draw any waters because, again, like, we, like I said in the previous example, we're not drawing the water molecules. That's our solvent. This would get way more complex and hard to look at with the waters. There might be times where we do want to represent waters, but not in this case. Okay. Now notice we have potassiums here, potassiums there, no change. We had chlorides here, chlorides to start with in solution, no change. What did change? Well, we had hydrogen ions. Those reacted with hydroxide and formed water. Hey, can you guess what our net ionic equation is going to be? Yeah, it's going to be that. I just looked and figured out what the spectators were. Potassium, chloride, those won't be part of it. What do we have left? Hydrogens plus hydroxides, and we get water molecules. I'm going to take you through the complete ionic and net ionic steps, net ionic steps to get to that. Complete ionic equation, let's just write out all of the ions. I guess I'm going to move through this one a little bit quicker. We get water at the end, and then potassium and chloride. Now, if we actually have water molecules where hydrogen and hydroxide are together, so I, I drew those together as the water. I didn't split those into ions. I agree. So now we're just going to cancel out things that are on both sides. We've got chlorides on both sides. We've got potassium on both sides. And what we're left with is our net ionic equation. Hydrogen ions plus hydroxide ions, and that forms water. They neutralize each other and form water. Now, as you get more practice with these, you can start skipping the complete ionic equation step. Um, this is kind of a halfway point to get to what we really want to know, which is what really happened in the reaction? What's our net ionic equation right here? So my recommendation is the first time you do these, do your complete ionic equation. Once you get good at it, if you're ready to, you can start skipping that middle step and just jump straight to the net ionic equation. Um, and the particulate diagram is a, another way to represent that and another way to think about what this net ionic equation means. Again, we got our spectators of potassium. They didn't change. They were aqueous. They're still aqueous. Chlorine, they're aqueous at the end, aqueous at the beginning. Nothing happened there. What did happen, we can see the hydrogens bond with hydroxides and formed water in our solution here. Let's look at one more example that's a little bit different. We're going to combine a particulate diagram with limiting reactants. And so we're going to start with a certain number of molecules of each reactant and see what would we have left over um, once this reaction goes to completion. Here's our example. Water vapor is synthesized or made by reacting oxygen gas with hydrogen gas. Show the products and left are reactants if four oxygen molecules react with four hydrogen molecules and the reaction goes to completion. So let's start by drawing our, our balanced molecular equation. We've got oxygen gas plus hydrogen gas. Those are both diatomic. Anytime they exist as gas, um, they're going to be uh, two atoms of oxygen, two atoms of hydrogen. Those are going to react to form water vapor or water gas. So I show that there. And then I need to balance this. So I need a two in front of the water and a two in front of the hydrogen. Now before I represent this reaction, I'm going to create a key over here on the right to show what the different symbols I use in the diagrams represent. So I'm going to use a filled in small dot for hydrogen and then a larger empty circle for oxygen. So to start off, we start off with four oxygen molecules. So I'll draw those there, remember they're diatomic, so two oxygen atoms per molecule. I'm gonna do the same thing with hydrogens. I have my four hydrogen molecules here. And then I need to figure out what am I gonna have left once I combine those into the same container. So the way that I do this is I go through and I circle um, each reactant. So I've got an O2, so I need one O2, and one of those will react with two hydrogens. So I'm going to circle two hydrogens here. And then when those react, they produce two water molecules. So I'm going to draw two water molecules. They look like little Mickey Mouses over there. And if you notice, I have the same number of atoms, right? One, two oxygen atoms, one, two, three, four hydrogen atoms. The same thing over here, two oxygen atoms, four hydrogen atoms. Okay, I'm going to do that again. Circle an O2 and two hydrogens, and I'll produce two more water molecules. But you'll notice something now. I've run out of hydrogens to react. So this reaction is done. It's gone to completion. The hydrogen's my limiting reactant because that's what stopped the reaction from going any further. We don't have any more hydrogens left, so we call that our limiting reactant. The other non-limiting reactant we call the excess reactant. Sometimes in a problem, it'll just say this is the excess reactant or something's added in excess. 
They're just telling you that that's X extractant. The other one's the limiting reactant. All right, next thing, if you notice, over here, I've got two oxygen molecules left that didn't react. Well, they're still going to be present. They don't just disappear, right, into thin air. They're still going to be present in the container, so we've got to draw those as well. And uh, that's easy to forget, but we need to include those in problems like this. So this is what we'd actually have left over. We've got some water vapor. We also have some oxygen gas left in at the end of this reaction. I'm going to go and do the net ionic equation as well, just to show you something. If you notice here, the oxygens, they don't split up into two ions, right? This isn't ionic oxygen. This is an O2 covalent molecule. They exist together, so we don't separate them in our net ionic equation. In fact, it would just be O2 plus, same thing for hydrogen. Notice how hydrogens aren't split up into H plus ions, so we have to represent it as H2 in our net ionic equation. And then we produce our water vapor over here, and those waters remain together as well. So if you notice here, our net ionic equation really is the same as our molecular equation because we didn't have spectator ions in this reaction. So um, really, that's that can be the same thing as a molecular equation. Hopefully this was helpful in you understanding particulate diagrams and net ionic equations, and have a great day.